Okay, you might want to keep the lights on for this one because uh, today's song is a little darker than your typical top 40 80s fare. It's an unorthodox track on an album that record executives call the career killer. It really was misunderstood from the very start. A hypnotic, haunting, and kind of horrible. Uh, this song told a tale that was too shocking to turn away from. So a spooky, eerie song on what critics said would be a career-ending album created by rock's most willfully obscure frontman, no less. What could go wrong? Stick around because you're about to find out next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever bought uh, packs of wacky packages or uh, garbage pill kids, you're going to love this channel. Pure, unadulterated nostalgia all the time. Make sure to subscribe below so you never miss out. We also have a Patreon where we host all sorts of exclusive content, including some upcoming specials, live event uh, that I'm going to be doing about the history of Professor Rock. The link for that is below. You can also check out our latest merch just below. So it's time to return to one of the newest shows that we do on this channel. I call it Career Suicide. This is where we break down an artist, a song, or an album that took a major risk. Maybe the gamble paid off, or maybe it was a complete disaster. In this show, it could go either way. But whatever the outcome, it's a guaranteed great story. Last time out, we covered David Bowie's Let's Dance. This time, however, we're going to revisit The Cure's Disintegration and their single Lullaby. Now, it's hard to believe now, but when the label heard this song and this album, they really believed it was a career killer. Uh, more on that later. Now, on April 21st, 1988, Cure frontman Robert Smith celebrated his 29th birthday. For Robert Smith, the party was short-lived. Uh, that's because he immediately started thinking about his 30th birthday, which filled him with utter dread. Not only did the big 3-0 highlight his mortality, Smith also worried that his prime creative years might be behind him. The faces of rock legends whom he believed produced their best work in their 20s flooded into his mind. The Beatles, The Stones, Zeppelin, Bowie, Hendrix, The Who, so many more. As he thought about what they had accomplished together or separately, Robert feared that he hadn't created anything meaningful. Yes, The Cure had accumulated years of success. They were just coming off their seventh album, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, a platinum-bound double album that featured their first top 40 single in the U.S., Just Like Heaven, perfect song. Robert Smith yearned for more than popularity, of course. He wanted to leave an indelible mark on rock history, to compose an undisputed masterpiece of a record. Uh, driven by this anxiety, Robert Smith isolated himself in his London home, and he set to work writing the most intense demos that he'd ever made to that point. Drawing inspiration from the darker, more introspective records in the Cure's catalog, uh, Robert Smith developed several long and dramatic instrumental pieces. But as he reflected on this new batch of songs, Smith wondered if they fit the Cure aesthetic. They were so different from the Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me material. And for a while, he considered using them for a solo project instead. I was shocked to find that out. The following June, the band gathered at drummer Boris Williams' home to give these instrumentals a, a thorough listen. At this time, the rest of the band included Simon Gallup on bass, keyboards, a Pearl, and now Pearl, but Pearl Thompson on guitar, Roger O'Donnell on keyboard, and Lil Tallhurst on, uh, well, he's credited with other instrument on the album. We'll touch on that in a few minutes. When Robert Smith played his home-recorded demos uh, for his bandmates, they were all blown away. And their clear enthusiasm for the material made Robert Smith reconsider his solo album ambitions. And maybe these were Cure songs after all. Now, The Cure rehearsed the demos for the next two weeks and wrote even more demos after that, including today's featured piece, Lullaby. Between the songs that Robert Smith brought with him and the additional material, The Cure cranked out over 30 demos for this new album. Now, fast forward to September, the band reconvened 
to pin down the best songs from the lot and to prep them for studio work. Then in October, they gathered at outside studios in Hook End Manor to record Disintegration, one of the greatest albums of all time. As we get into Robert Smith and the Cure's, uh, you know, the recording of this album, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses that I wear all the time. You know, if you are in the market for a new pair of glasses or sunglasses, Zenny has got you covered. All you have to do is go to zenny.com, you design your own custom pair, you put in your prescription, and they deliver them right to your door. Take a look at zenny.com today. So while the summer sessions were mostly uh, stress-free at this point, their time in the studio would be far more intense, and the band would face several obstacles in completing the album, uh, beginning with Robert himself. Like I said, Robert Smith was still grappling with the pressures of turning 30 and you know, delivering his magnum opus, and he'd become deeply depressed. And as a result of this, he turned to the bottle and hallucinogenic drugs. He also sequestered himself from virtually everyone, and he sunk into what he called one of his no-talking modes. What he said is, it sounds really big-headed, but everyone wanted a piece of me. I was fighting against being a pop star, being expected to be larger than life all the time, and it really did my head in. When we were going to make the album, I decided I would be monk-like and not talk to anyone. It was a bit pretentious, really, looking back, but... I actually wanted an environment that was slightly unpleasant. I end a quote. Robert Smith wasn't the only one who was struggling, though. Keyboardist Lowe Tallhurst was sick from alcoholism, and he was no longer gelling with other members of The Cure. Depressed as well, uh, he fell into a downward spiral that culminated with his ousting from the band uh, as soon as the album was completed. If these personal dramas weren't enough, the band also had to contend with a house fire that started one night in the studio's living quarters. Uh, I guess Robert Smith's room caught on fire. He barely managed to save a satchel that contained all of Disintegration's lyrics. The blaze was contained and put out, but afterward the whole house smelled like charred wood. And Robert's room had become a black burnt mess. Ah, oh, man, thank the heavens that uh, he saved those lyrics. Otherwise, who knows if we would have had uh, one of the greatest albums ever or what it would have sounded like. I will always love you, I will love you. The biggest blow of all came courtesy of the band's label, Elektra. Uh, a month before Disintegration was finished, the band met with company executives to listen to the album. A listening party. According to Robert Smith, the label was expecting a Kiss Me sequel, record with some obvious top 40 pop-centric flair. They hated Robert's melancholy vision, and they walked out of the session muttering something inaudible, apparently. Elektra held the album in total contempt, and they were seething about Smith's artistic about-face. They believed that the success of Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me had finally positioned The Cure as a commercial moneymaker. And, uh, well... Disintegration had a little in common with its predecessor. Robert Smith would later comment on it. Uh, there was just this look of absolute dismay on people's faces. I was informed about a week later that I was committing commercial suicide. They wanted to push the release date back. They thought that I was being willfully obscure, which was an actual quote from a letter that I received from Elektra. Ever since then, I realized that record companies don't have a clue what The Cure does, and really what The Cure means, end of quote. Uh, he would also go on to say that he thought it was his masterpiece, and they thought it was shite. <laughs> and despite the pushback from uh, disbelievers, Robert Smith held true to his vision for disintegration, and uh, the album was released on May 2nd, 1989, less than two weeks after his 30th birthday, mind you. Robert Smith may have just missed his 20-something deadline, but the album was everything that he could have hoped it would be. Just lush sonic textures and whimsical wordsmithing combined to create the ultimate hypnotic and ethereal mood piece. It's just mesmerizing, really. I mean, listening to Disintegration is a transformative, supernatural experience. From the opening moments of Plain Song to the closing strands of Untitled, <laughs> 
just immersed in an auditory atmosphere that fills in the space all around you. And, and then when there's nowhere else for it to go, it penetrates deep into your skin, soaking into your very soul. With an average length of six minutes for each song, it feels like its own epic offering. Every, every track on this album is it's worth a deep dive. But since today we're focusing on just one song, I'll bury the guilt and just mention the singles. Fascination Street, uh, Love Song, which went to number two, Pictures of You. Today's showcase, The Waking Bad Dream Beauty, Lullaby. Now, Lullaby was Disintegration's uh, first single, at least in the UK. Uh, it was the third release here in the US. Um, it's a song that just taps into a very dark theme for a mainstream audience. Its title is wholly ironic, and the gist of its story is this. Robert Smith is lying in bed, getting ready to go to sleep when a spider-like monster that he calls Spider-Man steals into his room and slowly eats him alive. That's about it. The spider is having you for dinner With a storyline like that, uh, this is clearly not a song for the uh, faint of heart. It seems to be the bulk of the American audience because Lullaby only reached uh, number 74 in the Hot 100. Did, however, climb to uh, number 23 on the U.S. Alternative Airplay chart. But it seems that the general public here wasn't ready to embrace this song. Yet for Robert Smith, and for anybody willing to give it a thoughtful listen, Lullaby is so much more than a, a scary story. It's an unflinching look at what it means to succumb to our fears. This is a point that I want to come back to in greater depth at the end of this deep dive. So I guess uh, there's a lot in this song that can be traced back to Robert Smith's childhood. But even as I say this, I need to bring up a caveat. That Robert Smith's personal history is always first and foremost filtered through uh, what degree he's willing to cooperate with interviewers. Let's just say that he isn't exactly known for being 100% truthful in official conversations. Just so witty. Uh, keep that in mind, of course. It could be stupid to believe someone like Paul Weller. Simply have to be particularly stupid to believe someone like me. Some claim that Lullaby is an ode to one of Smith's many childhood nightmares. Others say it was inspired by traumatic bedtime stories that his uncle told him when he was a child. Uh, and in another account, Smith said that the song was just the sort of thing his dad would sing to him as a young boy. Said Robert Smith, he used to make them up. There was always a horrible ending. There would be something like, uh, sleep now, pretty baby, or you won't wake up at all. Uh, Smith also had a vivid imagination as a boy. Apparently, their home was decorated with weird patterned wallpaper and weird patterned carpet. And young Robert Smith would stare at these patterns until he saw faces or ghosts emerging from them. Sometimes they would be friendly, but uh, sometimes not. At the age of just five, Smith's penchant for fantasy even convinced him that there was an unwelcome guest that was living in a secret room in the house. Intuitively, of course, Robert Smith knew that He'd never be able to see him, even if he somehow found the room. Uh, Robert Smith remembered, I'd hear creaking and I'd think it was a person on the stairs. I'd rush out of the bedroom to catch him and there would be no one there. They were just too fast for me. <laughs> so maybe by now you've made some curious connections between Lullaby and Robert's childhood. But there's one more pertinent bit of information that I really need to throw out there. Robert Smith is deathly afraid of spiders. These eight-legged villains have been freaking him out since he was a kid. I don't blame him. I hate spiders too. Uh, I guess they were always in his bed, or at least that's what he imagined. And with an imagination like Robert Smith's, I'm sure that there wasn't much of a difference. Spiders are one phobia that Robert Smith hasn't been able to overcome to this day. So now that these flashbacks have set the stage for today's spine-chilling cradle song, let's get into it. Starting with the intro, which is a full minute of irresistible seduction. From the moment that the, the music hits you, Robert Smith and company begin to pull you in inch by inch. 
until without realizing it, you're tangled up in a web of sinister delight, melodic hooks, clipped strings, sharp stabbing rhythm guitar and synthesized keyboards, all that create a potent blend of soothingly spooky songcraft. And then there's this infectious bass and the drum beat that keeps your subconscious mind marching ever deeper into this song. And then of course, there's Robert Smith's hypnotically hushed vocals, which really seal the deal. All of it put together just draws you into a state of serene stillness. Everything is calculated to let down your defenses. It's brilliant, really, because once you let down your defenses, that's when uh, the song's nightmarish narrative locks its arms around you and just refuses to let go. Yeah, as I think about it though, as distressing as this song is, Robert Smith really goes full poet with his lyrics here. For instance, check out how he opens things up. On candy striped legs, the Spider Man comes softly through the shadow of the evening sun. Legs, the -Man comes. Still in past the windows of the blissfully dead, looking for the victim shivering in bed. It's ominous from the get go, and he really paints a picture that puts you right there with him. It's like He's a modern day Lewis Carroll. It's a Jabberwocky like poem. You feel like you're the one in bed, paralyzed in fright. You're right there. Now, as the song progresses, this desperate worst case scenario story continues to unfold little by little. Quietly he laughs and shaking his head, creeps closer now, closer to the foot of the bed. Creeps closer now, closer to the foot of the bed. Until the monster has complete control over its powerless victim. Okay, I'll admit, um, it's pretty messed up. It's dark, it's devious, it's disturbing. So as listeners, what are we supposed to do with this? Do we let the fear take over or do we ride this one out with Robert Smith? Now for any sensitive soul, this is a tough decision because this song only gets more sinister from here on out. This sadistic spider creature takes a palpable pleasure in toying with its meal. As we reach the close of this ode to villainy, it's clear that there are no happy endings in this song. Robert Smith finishes his terror-filled tell by describing the sensation of being eaten alive. But then in a twist, Robert Smith states that in the morning he will wake up in the shivering cold. So we're left to ask, you know, was it all a bad dream? Was he not eaten after all? Honestly, it seemed pretty real to me, but I guess maybe that's the point. I don't think the lyrics are meant to be absolutely literal. As Robert issues his final warning, we realize that this isn't the first time that this has happened and probably won't be the last. This hellish episode is gonna continue to play on repeat. Which really leads us to ask, what does this song even mean? There's been a lot of speculation over Lullaby, of course. Some have wondered if it's simply a retelling, like I said, of one of Robert's childhood nightmares. Other commentators have suggested that uh, the song is a metaphor for any one of a number of themes. Uh, drug addiction, abuse, depression, uh, insanity, or even sexual assault. While I'm sure that Lullaby could be taken at face value as a scary song, my gut tells me there's just more to it than that. When you break it down to its, its bare bones, I really think this song is about a predator and a victim, which can then take on any number of forms. So addiction, mental illness, attackers, abusers, all fit the bill. Music has this incredible ability to, to fit the schemes of our imagination, making individual interpretations all the more legitimate. I was 13 when Disintegration came out, and uh, from the point I was 13 up until now, I gotta tell you, this song is unbearably uncomfortable. But even though it makes me squirm, maybe you too, Lullaby shines a light on topics that we might not talk about. Far too many people have personally experienced some horrific variation of this song, 
can be really hard to reach out and tell someone about it. So what Robert Smith has done, and what he always does, it seems, is creating art like this, and this song is absolutely art. He starts an open-ended conversation that people can join in on whenever they're ready. Maybe for someone that it's, uh, it's a much needed first step in the direction of hope. While Lullaby didn't exactly storm the US charts, it did garner a lot of success internationally. Uh, starting with the UK where it rose to number five. It's actually The Cure's all-time highest charting single in the UK, if you can believe that. Lullaby also broke the top 10 in quite a few other countries. It went to number eight in the Netherlands, uh, number seven in New Zealand, uh, number five in Norway and Austria, number four in Spain, and number three in Ireland and Germany. Over the years, Lullaby has also appeared in several movies and TV shows, uh, Cold Case in 2004, there's an Entourage in 2008, Misfits in 2010. There's a 902 and uh, the BBC's Natural World. It's also uh, had the great honor of being covered by Jimmy Page and Robert Plant back in the 90s, which blew my mind. So what of disintegration? Were the suits of Electra right? Of course not. The album shattered everyone's expectations, except maybe Robert Smith's. Disintegration garnered massive acclaim upon its release and it climbed all the way to number three in the UK. In the US, the album peaked at uh, number 12. And it broke the top 10 in at least, uh, I think, 13 or 14 countries. Disintegration even outsold its wildly successful predecessor, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, which the record label did not think had a chance to do. So much for commercial suicide. In the years that have passed, this otherworldly, delightfully melancholic album has been widely lauded as one of the preeminent alternative rock records of the 80s. And to this day, it remains The Cure's best-selling album. I would guess that it's the fan base's favorite album of The Cure's as well. Oh, and remember that letter that I talked about earlier that the executives from Elektra sent to Robert Smith about being willfully obscure? And how disintegration was complete trash? Well, Robert Smith kept that letter. And he said that he cherishes it because it reminds him never to doubt his own vision. Odds are he probably framed it. To anyone who isn't hell-bent on exploiting musical genius and has listened to Disintegration with open ears, there is no doubt that this album is absolutely majestic. And even though all the songs on this album are extraordinary, I think at least part of the credit has to go to Lullaby. It's a song that has far greater significance than its U.S. chart performance. Can you imagine if those record executives had had their way? Lullaby might never have seen the light of day. And that would have been tragic because I have no doubt that this dark fable has affected millions of listeners the world over. Hopefully, just maybe, it's helped some of them to, to boldly confront the demons in their own lives. It's one of my favorite records of all time, and I cherish every listen. To me, it's the Citizen Kane of pop music. <music> Leave us a comment about The Cure and The Lullaby. Very dark track. What do you think this song is about? Uh, let us know in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you think. But what are your experiences and memories of disintegration? If you like this episode, be sure to check out our other Cure offerings from Boys Don't Cry to Just Like Heaven to Friday I'm In Love. Got you covered. I love The Cure, one of my favorites of all time. Uh, if you have, haven't done so already, make sure to click the red button to subscribe. That way you never miss out on our daily videos. Your support really does help us to keep uh, the music alive, and that's the goal. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.